All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to Machine Organization and Programming. Uh, sorry this video is coming out so late. I've had just a terrible time putting this one together. I actually started working on this on Friday. I can't believe it. I'm probably 25 hours into making this particular video right now, and I'm just starting recording over from the beginning. Probably looking at another two hours of recording, an hour of rendering, rendering um, half hour to upload to YouTube, so I'm getting close, maybe. All right, um... So anyway, what I wanted to do with this video and why it took 25 hours to make, our book goes really deeply into cache memories, the topic for today. It does a great job, but it's very technical. They use a lot of math, a lot of formulas, and a lot of abbreviations for things. Uh, and these are things that are actually really pretty easy to visualize with pictures. So I spent a bunch of time making what I think are some pretty good pictures for this one. I'd like you guys to think of this video as an introduction that you can use to help prepare to read the book. Um, and I just want to say thank you to, uh, there were several of you guys who sent me an email right away letting me know there were technical problems with my original videos. It was done in two parts. Um, I had set it up to render both of them at the same time, and I had sorted my clips. I had them in different folders, um, and I think it was moving those files that led to that corruption. I've actually screwed this up before, but I moved the files during the rendering. This time I did it first. I don't know. Guys, I thought I was getting good at this video production process, but this one has been really challenging. So thank you to those guys who sent me an email letting me know there was a problem so I can get this fixed. Um, it actually looked fine uh, from what I could see on YouTube, but it wasn't visible at all for you guys. So, um, And then when I played it back, it's mostly just black. It like didn't have any content at all, just black. So I've tried to do a little bit of recovery from what was still there, and then just gave up. I'm starting over. All right, so with that said, um, let's jump right in. So uh, cache memory, uh, cache actually uh, means to store something, or it's also used as the noun, a store, like where I, I like a, might keep a collection of stuff, like collection of data. And we're gonna break this down into like four sections. We're gonna start off talking about uh, the memory hierarchy. Then we'll look at locality, which is the key principle by which caches uh, take advantage of to um, make our code run faster. And that's the whole point of today's lecture is well, can we take advantage of what hardware vendors and manufacturers have done to write code that goes even faster? So the last section is gonna be about writing cache efficient, efficient code. All right, so this is my picture from the very first lecture about what happens when we run a program. So way back uh, eight weeks ago, we had a simple C program that just added stuff together stored on the hard drive we compiled it into binary that binary code was loaded into main memory and we had the code there we had a section for data we talked about the stack and the heap later in the semester but to run this code the code was transferred over to the processor cpu we have registers here and we just learned a lot about assembly we're talking about communicating with memory with all of those move instructions um, that's what's going on when we're doing this. We're also transferring instructions so we know what to do next with the code. Uh, the problem is that communicating with main memory, while pretty fast, uh, is, is still pretty slow in the scheme of things. It would be much more convenient if we had a stash of memory, a cache of memory right here, right next to the CPU, where I could store the memory that I'm working with right now. So that's the idea behind um, what's going on with the CP or with this cache idea. I want to have another level of memory that's going to be fa even faster. So think about it like this. A hard disk is a magnetic disk. It actually spins around. It's got little reading heads that as it scans over, reads something and sends it up to the main memory. Okay, and then it gets stored up there. This is an extremely slow process, but it can move big chunks of memory all at once. To go from main memory over to the CPU, um, is much, much faster. Main memory is volatile DRAM for dynamic uh, RAM. Um, the volatile means that we have to, it's based on capacitors and we have to continuously read it and then write it again to keep it there. Um, and this is uh, generally much more expensive than a hard disk per, you know, byte. I think my computer's got a two terabyte hard drive in it that I spent about 50 bucks on. Main memory, I think I spent about 100 bucks and I have 16 gigabytes. Um, and then my CPU has like, what, six general purpose registers, and it was like $200. Uh, it does have an L1, L2, and L3 cache. Actually, I think that's the next slide. Yep. Um, 
So here's the idea. Uh, this is sort of the memory hierarchy. As we go from like my hard drive down here and optical drives, I do have a DVD drive in my machine, um, up in uh, up this the level here, main memory is going to be a different technology. This is going to hard drives are permanent storage. They're just actually going to write it with a magnet by changing the magnetic orientation of the the little um, material on the hard disk. Um, main memory is going to be DRAM, um, which is a like I said dynamic uh, memory. It's based on capacitors, and we have to like uh, either charge them or discharge them. Um, then we have uh, these cache memories on the CPU, and there's three different levels on the one that I own. Um, the L3 cache is shared between all of the different cores on my computer, and I believe L1 and L2 are dedicated to each core. But as we go up, they get smaller and smaller. So the L1 cache is really quite small. I think there's a table in the next couple slides. Um, I'll get there in a second. Um, there is a table, I'm not sure how soon it is. Uh, there's, um, <clears throat> but so as we go up, they get smaller and smaller, they get faster and faster. So these L1, L2, and L3 caches are based on uh, SRAM, static RAM, uh, which is a transistor based technology. It's uh, basically a, some sort of toggling flip flop circuit, which uses six gen transistors instead of just one capacitor, much more expensive to make. And then at the very top level, we've got like six general purpose registers to work with integers right on the CPU, right next to the uh, units to do the all of the mathematical and logic processing. All right, let me see what I was going to say. Yep. Smaller, faster, and more expensive at the top. All right. And then um, here's the real secret to why we do this. It's because it takes so long to access uh, the technologies at the very bottom, the hard drive. If I needed to move one byte from the hard drive to the CPU. Um, this is all written in CPU cycles. This is how many, basically how many operations the CPU can do while we're waiting for stuff. So access time for the, for the registers should really be zero, I believe here. I have a, so I got this data from the text in the book in like chapter like 6.1. And then there's a chart later on in the book for a specific computer with different measurements. I'll, I'll pull that up uh, near the end of the lecture. But the idea here is they, they get slower, takes more and more cycles as we go down. So like, here's main memory. This is what we've sort of been imagining, at least as I've been talking, is the registers are communicating, they're getting something from main memory. Um, but that can take like 50 to 100, uh, 50 to 200, like 100 cycles. That means the CPU can be, could be doing 100 operations in the time it's waiting for main memory to give something. It's only got six registers, and if it has to like do anything more complicated, it's going to be going to main memory all the time. This is going to be incredibly slow. So what we've got here instead is we're going to bring whatever data we need closer and closer and closer to the CPU. So, and these much closer memories, like the L1 cache right next to the CPU, has a much faster access time. Okay, so next I want to introduce the idea of locality. And we have two different versions of locality. This is going to be the secret by which cache memories are successful at making programs go faster. Basically, the idea is I'm going to be moving data in blocks up this uh, hierarchy. So basically, when I start my program and I copy it from the hard drive into main memory, I'm probably going to copy the entire program because it can move large chunks of data during those 1 million to 10 million cycles. Then as I move things to the L3 cache and the L2 cache, these might hold uh, kilobytes of data and, you know, um, you know, not necessarily the whole program, but I can move a chunk of data closer. And then finally, when I get to the level of the register, I'm just moving four bytes at a time. So what I want to make sure that I do is have the data that I need um, next really close to whatever I just moved. So it'll be in the same chunk that moves closer. So let me see here. I've got some notes. Temporal locality is going to be in that I'm going to be accessing the same piece of data many, many, many times in a row, like the counter in a loop. Um, and if I'm using something like that, I don't want to have to go back to main memory to get it, use it, put it back in main memory, and then go get it again from main memory, use it. I want to keep it as close as possible to the CPU so it's fast to get those things that I'm going to use over and over and over again. Spatial locality is the other side of that. This is going to mean that I'm going to be, if I'm looking at like an array where all of the elements in my array are stored in a contiguous block of data, I'm going to be accessing a set of data 
where the next access is going to be something really close to it in memory. Um, got an example right here, just a quick uh, for loop that's going to sum the numbers of an array. So I, in this loop, I have both kinds of locality demonstrated here. So as far as temporal locality goes, um, the variables that I access many times during the summation of this loop, first I've got my counter variable. It's going to increment, you know, we initialize it here. We're going to check to see if it's less than n. That's the second use. We're going to increment it here. We're going to use it as the array index. That's basically three times every time we go through one iteration of this loop, I need an i. All right, the next piece of this that I'm going to need, uh, I've got sum here that I'm going to be collecting all of the array elements and uh, adding them together. This is going to be accessed on every single iteration of the loop. And also, I'm going to argue, too, that this n value is also going to be accessed on every iteration of the loop. The last thing we do, well, the first thing we do when we get to the top of the loop is check and see if i is still less than n. So I need access to that n. So I'd like to keep all three of those things in a register if I can, because I'm going to use them over and over and over. I only have six registers. I might need to dump one of them into L1 cache to store it temporarily while I'm doing something else, computing my array offset or whatever. And then I bring it back right away. But I don't want to have to go to a hard drive, something with 10 million cycle latency, to read that. Okay, we're also seeing a spatial um, locality here. Um, this is going to be found in the array object. Because arrays are stored in contiguous blocks of memory where each element is next to each other in the address space, as soon as I'm done with array element i, the next one, i plus 1, is going to be right next to it. So if I'm loading a block of data and just getting a set of memory addresses that are all next to each other, um, I will likely have moved that block of data into the cache really close to the CPU all in one chunk. So I've got several things there ready to go. Yep, and then just for the folks at home watching the PowerPoint slides, I put that, uh, I got i, n, and sum here for temporal, and quick reminder that the array is under spatial. Oh, and then the takeaway. Cache memories that can take advantage of locality can make your um, code run much more quickly by avoiding access to memory. That's a slow memory. It still needs to access memory, but it can use the quicker memories that are close, and it's going to move lots of stuff uh, closer to the memory all in one block. All right. So just a quick example of something known as a, a reference pattern. And just this is to I, like um, really get the idea of the spatial locality to sink in. Um, what I've got here is a 2D array. I've got uh, rows and columns, and I've just I've drawn it not as you would see in like uh, C code, but as uh, like as you'd write it as a matrix. So if I were to write this in C code, I would have um, all these elements in uh, uh, 2D, 2D array, ARR with them. Um, this has, let's see, three rows and five columns. Okay? Um, and here's what it would look like in memory. I just have all of my memory addresses in a contiguous block. And then I would just see, I've got the first row here, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Then I've got the second row. And this is the order they're stored in. All right? So now if I want to go and just compute the sum of all the elements in a two-dimensional array, I've got two choices for how I'm going to do this. I could, um, well, the best choice is to go across the rows at a time and add up all 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So this is the row major order. And then that's going to be this innermost loop right here. The J loop is going to increment the uh, column. Uh, so I've got rows I, column is J. It's going to increment the column piece. And it's going to move from 11 to 12 to 13. Uh, the other way that I can do this would be column order. And this would be switching these guys around. Um, so now I've got my rows in the outermost loop. The innermost loop is going to be from I to 0 to, from 0 to 3. And that's going to be incrementing the row first. So I'm going to be looking at adding 11 to 21 to 31, then 12, 22, 32. 13, 23, 33, then 14, 24. Okay, you guys got the idea. So um, these different reference patterns, I'm accessing pieces in array, I'm referring to them. This first one is known as a stride one reference pattern or a sequential reference pattern. I'm gonna go from the 11 to the 12 to the 13. Each piece of data is right next to the one that I just accessed. So they're very close in memory, this is great. This is far better than the stride k reference pattern where here the first thing i accessed was the 11 
And the next one was the 21. So that's one, two, three, four, five elements away. After that, I needed the 31. One, two, three, four, five elements away again. And then I needed the 12. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine elements away. After 12, I needed 22. That's five and five more. So this would be uh, referred to as a stride five pattern because as I'm moving across the array, I'm actually incrementing by five every time. So I'm not actually accessing things that are as close together in memory. So while you would really prefer to avoid this uh, stride K reference pattern, what we're gonna find is that in scientific computing, um, there's a number of operations using matrices that are very common, um, in particular taking the transpose of a matrix and multiplying one matrix by another that both require either a row so one, one version will access the rows, and then when you transpose it, it needs to put them in column order. So uh, these things do happen. They are common. And so if we can think about the patterns here, if we have a choice, we want to use the stride one version to make things go more quickly. But we may not have a choice. Uh, so the idea of locality also will apply to instructions. So here I just have a pretty simple program. It creates an array and calls a function sum. And then the function sum is just going to uh, initialize a variable, go through all of the elements of the array, and add them together, return that at the end. And here I'm looking at the code that goes through and implements the sum function. Yep, so I've got the sum label at the top. Uh, as we go through this, it's going to set up the stack. It's going to reserve some space for my um, local variables, uh, sum counter, and then um, set those up. Both are initialized to zero. And then this is a loop. So we're going to jump down to L2 and do the comparison to see if i is less than or n. And then if it is, we're going to jump up and go through the steps in this loop. Basically grab the data from the array and add it to sum. Then we get back to this comparison. So um, from the CPU's point of view, these instructions are the same as data. I just I have to move them to the CPU. The instruction pointer points at the right one. I get it in the... Um, uh, you know, I load that, I fetch the instruction, I decode it, I execute it. Um, if I have to go back to main memory to get the next instruction, that's longer than if I can move a block of instructions to the cache. You know, and this might be a block of instructions right here that all get moved together, and then they're very close. It's much more quick. Much, yeah, I can ex execute them much more quickly if they're uh, in memory that I can access, you know, L1 cache very, you know, quickly. I think I said quickly like eight times in a row. I've had a lot of caffeine today. Um, I'm going to do better. I'm going to talk slower. Let me, let me, all right, I'm going to try. So anyway, the point I was trying to make is that this locality idea applies to instructions too. So one of the things we can do to take advantage of that is if I have a loop that executes many, many, many times that, for example, if I'm calling a function inside of that loop, I'm going to have a function call in the middle of a loop structure that's got to set up all of the parameters, then it's got to... Um, execute the jump to the function somewhere else in code. It's going to have to go get that code, do whatever, and then return and then do all of the um, cleanup stuff. So not only do I have more instructions for a function call, but I also have the fact that it's going to jump to a different location in code and probably need to um, move that code closer to the CPU. And it's going to be trading back and forth between my loop here and the function call um, elsewhere in code. So some of the things I can do to optimize my code are to take little simple things like uh, very simple functions if they're in a loop and just put them, put the code directly into the loop and not make it a function call. It may go faster, but it's likely going to make your code harder to read. So there's a trade off there. Uh, there are places where it's definitely worth it, which is probably a lot of the reason why you guys are taking this class to think about those kinds of issues. All right. So here's the main idea about how um, caching works. So I, I stole this picture directly from the book rather than making it uh, myself. So it's got a lot of this text in here that I normally would have animated and made it look cool, but I'm still, uh, that was already a lot of hours into this. Okay, so here's the idea. At level K, and so like I had the CPU at the top, that would be K equals zero, level zero. Then I had an L1 cache, that would be K is equal to one. Below that, an L2 cache, then L3, then main memory would be L4. Um, or k, k equal 4. Here's the idea. So at any particular level k, could be CPU 1 or 0, could be L1, I've got some regions where I'm storing blocks of memory. And depending on what level it is, these blocks are going to be different sizes. All right? 
So in this case, I've got the entire level K cache here. Right now, it's got four blocks of data, and those are numbered 4, 9, 14, 3, okay? Now, these blocks were copied up to this level from a lower level, okay? So in level K plus 1, this entire thing might be one block that was copied from level K plus 2. So like if K plus 2 is the hard drive, I may have moved the entire program up as one block, okay? Now I've got one block here that's got a lot of little pieces and I may move that to the L3 cache in these much smaller blocks. So the block depends on what level I'm moving between. So I have the block size that depends on like whether it's transferring from level three to two or two to one. But anyway, I'm copying them in block size chunks. So I've got small, this one only holds four. This one's got 16 of this size block. Um, <clears throat> so fewer blocks at the top it's going to be faster to retrieve data from and much more expensive here we've got larger it's been transferred in as one chunk that's much bigger and this is kind of the idea so and now um just to go a quick kind of walk through i'm going to flip back and forth between these couple of slides and think about some of these issues so if i read so the cpu needs a particular piece of information all right it's going to ask for something in one memory address could be reading an integer or a character from address uh, 12, 34, 56, 78 in hex. If it's not in the cache, that's going to be known as a cache miss. Uh, if we suppose that this happens to be in block 4, and I'm, I'm making up these numbers, so block 4 of main memory, what we're going to see then is that's going to be copied from L3 to L2, the L1, and then just the piece I need into the register. So it's going to be moving up from wherever we do find that, and these caches are getting filled in with block 4 or the much larger block that contains block four that I need. Okay, so in fact, I have block four up here in this example. If the next thing I wanna read is the very next byte, so 12, 34, 56, 79, instead of 78, that is likely already gonna be in the same block. And I will move that up into L1 cache. And so this is known as a cache hit. So when the CPU says, I need this um, blah, 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 79, it's already there in L1 and I can just retrieve it because it is part of this block. And this block might have, uh, you know, a kilobyte of data or something. All right, if the next read is going to be from uh, some other address run in block 8, this will be a cache miss. Um, now, there are a lot of different rules for how we're going to be moving these blocks from level K plus 1 to level K. A lot of different systems. And that's uh, a big chunk of the last part of the lecture is how do you decide... So up here, I've got 4, 9, 14, 3. I do not have block 8 where my new next piece of data is stored. There are lots of just policies about which one do I evict. I just used level 4, so I, I'd likely want to keep that around because it's likely I'm going to use it again. Um, and depending on where in the memory hierarchy we're looking, they're going to be using different rules. So up at the very top, the L1 uh, cache rules are likely going to be that it's got to be copied um, straight across into a particular set. Um, they do this because it's all done in hardware. They've got to have the transistors and the interconnects that do all that stuff. And to implement like the logic to say, well, this one was just used, put it somewhere else, uh, is a lot of extra work. So a lot of times what we'll see is that like 0, 4, 8, and 12 all map to just one block up here at the high level. And but if we're talking about main memory, we can do a lot of the implementation of these algorithms to decide where to store stuff in software. And we have a lot more flexibility. So in that case, we're likely going to use a much more complicated algorithm to decide what to move, particularly because copying things from the hard drive is so slow. All right, so in this example, I would move, um, if this is the L2 to L1 cache, I'd be moving uh, block 8 straight up replacing block 4 and then accessing it for that kind of model. I've got, this is where I drew a lot of really great pictures coming up. Um, all right, and then just to finish this up, we evict block four and copy block eight again. Now, suppose I want this same value, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that I originally had, it's in block four. If I want this again, if I go back up, this is block of four up here has been replaced with eight. I have to now go back and copy it again. Uh, so not all of these policies are like optimal, but it could be that this swapping block eight and block four is so much faster than doing the math to figure out which one of these was most recently used or at least recently used, or which is the best choice. And again, that best choice has a lot of what-ifs that go into it. Um, 
it could be that it's just straight up replacements really quite fast uh, if we're doing if it's all implemented in hardware all right so just a quick example here right now I've got a very simple cache level K plus one uh, call it RAM I've got yeah here's my computer I've got registers I only have an L1 cache and I've got RAM so this would be an older model CPU so if I'm moving something from K plus one to K and here's what I've already loaded in memory from the hard drive I've got four blocks here one two three and four and then my level K cache is empty right now so the very first thing that happens if this is my access pattern and oh check this out guys I had no idea I could do this in the past I would have made 80 slides for this well one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, seventeen 17 slides for each one of these numbers as I like changed it. You can go to editing mode and record the presentation at the same time. So check this out. The very first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to move, uh, I'm trying to find uh, data piece one. Um, it's going to look in the cache right here, in the L1 cache, say it's not there, it's empty, and then it's going to go. Uh, so this is a, a cache miss, and this is a particular kind of cache miss called a cold miss, um, as in we uh, um, don't have it, the cache doesn't have anything in it, we absolutely will not find it if there's nothing there. It's also known as a compulsory miss. So first thing that happens is it goes and it's going to, oops, I missed, fill in the one and grab block one from that uh, data. Okay, um, next... Uh, thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab element 2 here. So element 2 is also going to be a cold miss. It's not in the cache. So the next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and grab, clicked on the wrong spot, uh, block 2 and move it into my cache. All right, I'm not going to worry particularly about placement rules at this time, but let's um, let's just say that blocks 1 and block 3 both map to the this one here. All the odd numbers go on the left one, and we'll say that 2 and 4, the even ones, go on the right as by way of this example. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be looking at grabbing block 2. It's already up here in the level K cache. So this is going to be a cache hit. So it's a hit if it's there, it's a miss if it's not. Alright, so the next thing I'm going to do, uh, next row, I'm going to be looking at access pattern 13131. So I'm going to go up here, level um, uh, L1 here does have block 1. So this will be a second cache hit. Okay, um, when I go to the three, however, got three right here is not in the cache, so it's a miss, and it needs to go and grab that. So if I'm putting all the odd numbered ones right here, I'm going to real quick fail at typing and put a three in right there. Okay, now next thing I'm looking for the one, it's missing. I just replaced it with a three. Even though I've got another block over here that would have been a great place to put the one, I'm putting the odd numbers on the left, it's going to get replaced with the 1. And then I miss again when I look for the 3. I need to go ahead and put the 3 back in. And then finally, to end up that row, I've got to replace it with a 1. All right. So this kind of missing, where I'm switching back and forth because I've got some sort of rule that says put all the odd numbered ones right here, or put everything that's divisible by a 6 over there, whatever the rule says, um, these are known as conflict misses. I've got a rule that's in conflict with something that would be an optimal solution. All right, so if we continue on now, if I'm looking at this bottom access pattern, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, what I'm gonna find is that, uh, and at this point, I wanna start ignoring that um, really strict rule. I'm just gonna put things, actually, I don't need to. I was gonna say I'm gonna flip back and forth, one, two, one, two, but the pattern actually makes them work out the same. So regardless, here's the idea. I'm gonna look for X uh, block one, it's there in cache level K, so that's a hit. Then I look for two right there, also a hit. Then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to need to go back and get three. It's not there, so I delete the one and I grab a three. Okay, then I need to go and uh, find element four. That's going to replace this block. Then I'm back to one again. So replace the three with a one, replace the four with a two, then replace the one with a three, and finally, last thing, replace the two with the four. So I just uh, basically had, uh, th starting with the three, one, two, three, four, five, six misses in a row. And the idea here is that the data that I'm working with, I'm using like all of this data. 
but I only have two levels or two blocks in this cache to store it. So this is known as a capacity miss. When the blocks I'm working with, that's now the working set in this case, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four are the elements that are recently accessed. Uh, when the number of blocks here is larger than the number of spaces to store them, this is a capacity miss. All right, just a quick formal definition of a block. A block is going to be a unit of data transferred between a K plus one and a K level, or, or backwards if I'm writing. So the idea here is if I have a block going from the L1 cache to the CPU, registers are going to hold four bytes. So the block size here is a four byte block. But what I might find is that my L2 cache might transfer data in blocks of 16 bytes or you know enough data to hold four integers um, all at once every time I request something. So the L1 cache here might have four integers in it in a block and the CPU might only need one of those. Okay, I made up these numbers. They're just, what I wanted to show is that as we go down this memory hierarchy, the block sizes get bigger. So I'm transferring you know, lots of bytes and then the next level might take fewer bytes than that and then fewer bytes. Um, and this is where we're getting that efficiency because in the same like amount of time that it, you know, it takes to access one byte, we're actually moving lots and lots of bytes up closer to the CPU that are nearby in memory so that we're gonna be able to take advantage of locality. And here's that other table I was talking about. So this one has lots of different kinds of caches. It's got uh, things that are not directly in the memory hierarchy that I was just talking about in the previous picture. So let me explain a little bit what's going on here. CPU registers, so on a 32-bit machine would have a four byte uh, size, eight byte on a 64-bit machine. Um, they're gonna be stashed in the CPU register and can be accessed immediately, no waiting. Um, the L1 cache is right here, so line three. Uh, on a modern computer, we're looking at 64 byte blocks. Uh, I guessed in my other example that it was like 16. So, no, oh, I was wrong, 64. Um, and this is gonna be on the, on the chip, on the same chip as the CPU. Uh, accessed in one cycle, apparently on this particular machine. And depending on how big they are, the type of CPU, I think this is a uh, Intel i7. It doesn't look like I copied that data. Um, anyway, we can access the uh, on-chip L1 cache very quickly. Um, this particular machine that they're looking at has an L2 cache also using 64 block uh, byte blocks, probably a lot more total blocks. Um, particularly if it's off chip, um, but this is accessed, you know, with 10 hardware cycle to 10 CPU cycles. Uh, L3, same thing. Um, here, the virtual memory, this is going to be the memory that we've been talking about in RAM the whole time. Um, so we'll be looking at four kilobyte blocks or also known as pages. That's going to be what I'm talking about when I come back after writing the final exam. Um, probably released on Thursday is my goal there. Uh, again, much, much slower. So the time it takes to go to RAM to get a piece of data, um, I can do 100 operations with the CPU, 100 additions, 100 multiplications, um, something like that. And then uh, also in main memory, this is the buffer cache. Uh, all they're doing here is saying that when I'm writing a file, um, I'm actually going to store that file as it's being written in main memory. I'm not going to write it to the disk yet, not until the main memory is synced with the uh, hard drive, let's see, where's yeah, disk cache right here. The disk controller is gonna take care of the stuff getting written to the hard disk. Um, yeah, and then I've got some other kinds of caches here. Like if I'm using a web browser, um, if I open up a page and then uh, it's gonna store a lot of stuff because accessing a web you know, um, server is very slow. If I go back to the, the same page again later, I've saved all those the pieces of data um, and uh, it'll show them to me again while it's waiting to see if it's up to date and if I need to you know, go get new information. Um, <clears throat> all right, so hope this was useful. It'll kind of give you some real ideas of the sizes and how fast things really go. Um, and just I want to highlight here that 10 million, 10 million is really, really, really slow compared to the stuff up here. It's a, you know, two orders of magnitude uh, difference here, 100 times more slow, slower. Uh, let's see, this is uh, 100,000 times slower than uh, accessing RAM. So it's important that we get the information as close to the CPU on that memory hierarchy as possible. 
when speed is important. All right, I'm back. <clears throat> so next topic um, is going to be how caches are actually organized and all the different pieces of them. This is the part where the book was using a lot of math and formulas when a picture is the much better. So I'm going to add lots of details to this picture. So first, this is my cache right here. Um, and each uh, uh, on the in the cache are going to be uh, a number of sets and sets are going to be places where I can store information. So um, each set will have a number of different lines in it. So in this case, I've got a, a, C, uh, a cache with, um, could be L1, with four different sets with two lines per set. Okay, and we'll always have the same number of lines per set. And almost always the number of sets will be a um, power of two, you know, one, two, four, eight. Um, so and in each line, let me see, click that, we're going to have a number. So each line is going to store a bunch of information. And here's the block that I've been talking about. In blue, I've got a bunch of data. This is my block. Okay. So the block size here is going to be seven. Whoops. Zero to seven is eight bytes. So I've got eight bytes worth of data in each block. And this particular cache holds one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight blocks with eight bytes each. So it's holding uh, more or less 64 bytes worth of useful information. All right, there's actually a lot more memory on the cache because I need to know, you know, where did these blocks come from? Uh, and that's what the rest of this stuff is for. All right, so also in each line, I, I've got a valid bit. That's just one bit, either a zero or a one. One if it's, if this is perfectly good data, zero if it's invalid. So when we first start up the computer, all of these valid bits will be set to zero because I haven't loaded anything yet. Okay, as soon as I start working with them, they'll be, you know, if I load some data, it'll be set to one. And then depending on what the computer does for writing things, if I'm if I make a write and it writes back down to the lowest possible level and skips this, this may be invalid. You know, if I take this first byte right here, which right now holds a zero, and write a four to it but I write it at the level below this and don't update this one, this is no longer valid. So I would just flip the valid bit to zero if I'm doing that sort of write. All right, um, and then last, this tag tells me which block uh, this data came from, or which, uh, I guess, so in memory, let me, actually, I think I've got a better, yeah, an example. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, so this tag is telling me where, you know, which real memory address these bytes correspond to. So here's the idea. Um, I've got, a, in this example, I'm looking at a 9-bit address, and here's the address in binary that I'm going to use for my example. Uh, we're going to break this into three pieces. So check this out. Over here on the right, I've got 8 bytes. Now, I can represent uh, 8 bytes with 3 bits. Okay, so this would be the 000, 001, 010, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, okay, and so on. I'm just counting in binary. Um, so in this case, I've got 0, 0, 1 as my three lowest order bits. Let me click, I put a box around it. So that means this is going to be a one byte offset. So I'm looking at this entire column where all the ones are stored of my blocks. Okay, so we're going to just take the memory address. You know, I'm going to, you know, move memory address 101110001 into um, uh, register EAX. You know, that's going to be the read command is go get something from memory. It's first going to look in the cache. And this is going to tell me that the byte that I want is going to be coming from this column right here, if it's in the cache. Okay, so that's the idea of the byte off. So the lowest three bits in this case. And those three, because I've got from zero to eight, and it takes three bytes to represent three bits to represent um, the number zero through eight. If I had a larger cache, if this held 16 bytes, then I would need a fourth bit. All right, hope that kind of makes sense. If that part didn't make sense, maybe watch the rest of this and then go back and rewind and check it out again. All right, the next pair of numbers here, I've got four sets. So set zero, set one, set two, and set three. In binary, this is zero, zero, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So these two bits are actually telling me which set it's from, the 1, 0 set index. And 1, 0 is uh, set 2. 
So right now I know that this memory address will only be stored in set 2 because of these two numbers from the address. These are the set index. Okay, so I can stop looking at set 0, set 1, and set 3 and just focus on this. I've got two um, lines uh, which have blocks, um, line 1 and line 2. So the next thing I need to do is take a look at the tag. And the tag is basically the rest of the address. And it's going to store the rest of the address for the particular block that it's read in the tag bit. All right, I think I do the next slide. Okay, um, so here's just a quick overview of that math that the book is doing. So I've got my picture here. I've got four sets, so S is equal to four. Uh, one, two, three, four. So picture version is way easier. I can just see them. They're yellow boxes. E is two lines. So I got them right there. The lines are green. Um, B is the number of bytes per line. I've numbered them right here, zero through seven, so eight bytes per line. And then M is the total number of bits in the address. I can just count them over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These are the abbreviations that they use for sets, lines, bytes, and total number of bits in the address. All right, and the total size of this cache C is the cache size. I'm just going to take S times E times B, multiply those together. I get, so 4 times 2 times 16. And again, there's um, 8 per line, 2 per line, 4 per line, 16. Hold on, hold on. I'm actually really good at math. I don't know what's wrong with me today. And you know, this is my second time through this, and I didn't catch this the first time. All right, there we go. Does that look like 64 bytes to you guys? I think it looks better now. Okay. All right, so, hope I didn't confuse anyone. Yep, four sets, two lines, eight bytes per line means the total useful cache size is 64 bytes. All right, so this is the, the book goes like a full page of math to get through all this stuff. Okay, I want to make a... There's three different kinds of caches that we're going to be looking at during the course of uh, the, the rest of this lecture. The direct map cache is the first one. Um, it's uh, one of the simpler ones. That's why I'm starting with it. Uh, we also have a set associative cache and a uh, fully, uh, fully associative cache. But the idea with the direct map cache is we only have one line per set. That means there's only one choice where I'm going to be able to store any particular memory address. So, uh, and I've got an example right here. Suppose I want to read address. So again, this is a 9-bit address. So I've got three hex digits. The first digit will always be a 0 or a 1 um, because that's going to be the ninth bit. Um, uh, so address 171. So first, I'm going to just go ahead and break this into, on a 9-bit machine, the binary. And I only need the rightmost nine bits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I'm going to ignore these first three because I only have nine bits. But to do one in hex, I needed the one right there. So first thing we'll do is we'll chop those off. And we'll take a look at the remainder of this useful information. All right, so first thing, uh, the byte is the last three, zero, zero, one. I guess I've got it in the middle here. The set is going to be these middle two bits. So 1, 0 is going to be set 2, byte 1, and my tag bit is 0, 1, 1. Okay, so what it's going to do is it's going to go say, oh, look, in this picture, the cache was cold. It's uh, completely unfilled with any useful information. All of these valid bits are, they're, well, here we'll do it. We'll just edit it right now, right here in place. That's a really tiny box to click on. There we go. So that one's going to be set to 0. Then in my next slide, after I go and retrieve this information from memory, uh, the, the valid bit will be set to 1. The tag bit will be set to whatever this beginning part of the address is, however many bits there are. In this case, I need 4. And then this is going to load a bunch of memory, in this case 8 bytes, but I only really care about byte 1. So I've got it bold here and a little bit larger. That's going to be the one that's passed on to the CPU. That's the one I care about. It just happens to be in this uh, block of memory stored at a particular address that I can decode using the tag, the set, and the byte number, byte offset. Okay, hope that makes sense. I've got a couple more examples of this. 
So suppose we come back now and I want to read a different address. So in this case, um, I just did the binary. I, I thought you guys have seen enough me like flumbling through translating hex to binary. Um, here's the idea. Again, I've got the tag bits, the set bits, and the byte offset. So this is going to be set one. So now I'm looking at this uh, set. It's only got one line in a direct mapped cache. Uh, so there's only one choice where this can go because these two bits tell me it's set one. It goes right here. As soon as I go read this from memory, the valid bit will be set to one. Uh, when I read this, I need to record the tag so I, knew, I know what it is. And then um, this is the byte I care about, byte 3, uh, 0, 1, 1. So I've got that bold, a little bit larger. All right. So maybe one more example. If I go back and I want to read um, this address, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. This 1, 0 is going to be also from set 2. Oh, check this out. Set 2 is valid. I've got a valid bit right there. Um, the problem, I've already updated here. The problem was set2 uh, has a tag bit. This is holding memory with the address that starts with 1011. So the next thing it does is it checks and sees, is this 1011? And it's not. It's 0000. So the tag is wrong. So this is going to be a cache miss. Even though it's valid, the tag is not matching. So it's going to go back to um, main memory and grab the correct block of data with the correct tag. So in this case, it's going to grab the 0000, put that and grab the information stored in main memory, and then access byte 7, send that onto the CPU. All right, guys, for the next example, I just want to walk through um, just doing a simple dot product and talk about some of the issues that are going to arise. So if you take a look at this, I'm declaring an integer array x, uh, like a math vector with numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 in it, and uh, another four-dimensional or a four uh, member uh, array um, or a y with a four, three, two, one in it. And then I'm just going to go through and multiply each element. Multiply, multiply. Check this out. Instant. Nope, nope. Shift eight. Multiply. Editing on the fly. Man, I love this. If I had known this was there at the beginning, oh, that would have saved me so much time. All right, I, I apologize. Okay, and we're just going to do this in a loop. We're going to go from zero to four. Um, I plus plus. We're just going to take the product of elements of the same position in the array and add them to a sum. Uh, assume sum is initialized uh, somewhere else to zero, and um, also that we're going to keep i and sum in registers and not worry about what's going on with the cache for those guys. Okay, I've got a very simple cache. I, I wanted something even simpler than before, so I've got two sets uh, with one line each. So that makes this a direct mapped cache because it only has one line per set. Each of these lines hold eight bytes or two integers because I'm gonna use four byte integers for this example. Okay, and then um, I'm just gonna go through. Uh, very first thing we do, I'm gonna ignore i and just talk about the x and the y. So x of zero is uh, stored at memory address zero, zero in my example. So the one is stored right here. So the address I need to go get Oops, oops, oops. Type it on the wrong screen. Okay. Address, uh, yep, zero, zero. In binary is, uh, zero, zero. Got basically eight zeros. Now, in my, um, system here, I'm going to take a look at this. I've got one, two, three, four, eight bytes here. So that means that, uh, the first three bytes over on the most rightmost side are going to be the the byte offset bits that I need. Okay, so that's those three right there. I only have two sets, so that means I only need, clicking on the wrong screen mic, I'll get used to it, one byte for the set offset. So set offset is just going to be zero in this case, and then the rest of these bytes are going to be my tag. So what I do is I go, first thing I check out, this is not valid, go to memory, grab this. Okay, so it's going to change the tag to, I'm going to delete it, change it to 0000, okay? It's going to change the valid bit after it's grabbed it to a 1. And then instead of having whatever garbage is stored from whoever used my, uh, this memory last, I'm going to be storing the 
integer one, and then also it's going to grab this next piece too. It's going to create, it's going to grab eight bytes. So I'm going to store a one and a two in here. And I'm just going to do the very first example. Um, so the first byte uh, for a, if this were a CSL machine, this is a little Indian machine, I would be storing zero one in here. And then zero zero, zero zero, zero zero. So something like that would be the first four bytes. All right, let me uh, make this a little bigger. The second value is going to be two on a little Indian machine. In that case, I'm looking at, come on, come on, click the right spot, Mike. Instead of four, we're going to have, so the lowest order byte for the one is uh, listed first. This is what's stored in memory. Okay, I'm satisfied. This is looking good to me. All right, um, so I've grabbed that. It's going to be used right here for x of zero. All right, next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go and grab y zero and multiply by that first one. So let's see here, y zero. In fact, I should do a better job of labeling these. Hold on one, one more sec. This is x zero. This is x one. I mean, all right, I'm going to pause and actually put those in one sec. All right, so I got my addresses put in here now. I can easily see that x0 is there, x1 is there. The other thing, uh, the very first time I had a cold miss, so that's going to be, stop that mic, right in the right spot, our first miss. We'll just keep track over here of hits and misses. All right, next, we're going to be grabbing y0. y0 is stored at address 10 and hex. So let me just real quick do my binary address right here. Let me click in the right spot. We'll put that together in binary. So uh, one zero is going to be zero 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 one zero 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 zero. Okay. So the first three bits are going to tell me the byte offset. The next uh, bit is going to be which set it belongs to. And then this address is going to be my tag bit. Okay. So this is going to clearly belong to. Let's see here. Oh, I was using the mouse pointer on the wrong screen. All right, that might be a problem. So byte offset, zero, zero, zero. Um, set bit, zero, and tag right there. So I'm going to go look at set zero. I see that it's valid. Excellent. That's perfect. Then I check the tag and recognize that, oh, it's not the right tag. I'm looking at a different piece. So this is going to be a miss. So next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to memory and read this in. So right here y0 is going to be the value 4 um, so then this should be uh, clicking the right spot Mike so 4 uh, least order bits are stored first and I'm also going to grab the entire block so that's going to be from y0 I need 8 bytes worth of data in order so also includes y1 which is the 3 so that's what I've got right there now alright and then I can multiply those two numbers together uh, X, uh, I would be stored in register, that one's now in memory, move it to a register, multiply, add it to sum, and we are on the next iteration through the loop. Okay, excellent. Now, we just had X1 in memory, it should be good, right? So let's take a look. Uh, memory address. Click on the other screen. So, uh, 04 is 0, 0, 0, 0, and then, let's see, 0, 0, 1, 0. You missed. 1, 0, 0. There we go, address number four. Uh, real quick, we'll divide this up into the set bit and the byte offset. So, um, byte offset there is going to be four. So, zero, one, two, three, four. It'll be the second block of four uh, bytes to get to that one integer. All right, so next up, um, zero, set zero. Right there, set zero, perfect. Uh, it's even valid. That's great news until we check the tag bit. I didn't change the tag bit last time, did I? Hold on, hold on. I forgot to update the tag bit. Pretend I just did this. So when I loaded 3 and 4 into memory, it's valid, but I forgot to change the tag bit to go along with that data right there. Should have been a 0001. Okay, I apologize, guys. Uh, let me try and get all the details right this time. Okay, so it's valid, but it's the wrong tag. That's going to be a miss. Miss number three. Okay, next, after that, I need to go look it up. 
So I'm going to go set zero. It's going to be valid after I'm done loading it. My tag bit will change to a 0000. And then I'm going to go grab this block of data. Um, so in that case, click in the right spot. This is a one and that's a two. So for that one and that two right there. Now I can go and take these four bytes right here, send them onto the register as X1 and continue on. All right, next thing I do, uh, I need this Y of one, should be a three, it's that three right there. That three right there stored at address 14. All right, let me go ahead and break this down. 0001 for the one part. The four part is 0100. And then we'll break this into three for the um, byte offset. And again, that's because I've got eight bytes up here and I take three bits to represent an address in eight um, with eight possible combinations. Okay, the set is gonna be zero. I've only got two sets, so I need one bit for that. Set zero, we're still in this top one. All right, ooh, it's valid, check that out, awesome. And then we look at the tag, all right, not valid, it's the wrong tag. So that's miss number four. All right, so we'll go ahead and we'll just uh, load that in. Uh, so that number becomes a one, and then I'm loading that entire block, click in the right spot. So that's gonna be a four there and a three there for that four and that three. Then I can go grab these four bytes the 0, 03000000 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 for the number three. Send those onto the register, do that multiplication, and add it to sum. All right, uh, I think at this point I've probably done about enough. Well, let's do one more, one more, just because uh, this next one will use set one, I believe. Hold on. So the next time through the loop, I need to grab x2. So x2 is stored at address 0, 08. So that's going to be. Zero, 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 one, zero, zero, zero. All right, break this into byte offset and set. Finally, we're in the other set. Okay, check it out. It's not valid though. All right, so that's yet another miss. This is a cold miss because uh, nothing's ever been stored in here. The tag, tag, click in the right spot, Mike. It's gonna be, let's see, zero, 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 zero for those four bytes. And then um, I'm storing the values three and four. One second, real quick, let me make this look like the other one. All right, how's that look? Okay, except now I need numbers three and four. I got the wrong numbers here. Three and four, done. Okay, so now I can go ahead and say, all right, I need bit zero. So I'm gonna start right here at zero offset from the beginning. And I'm going to grab four bytes and send them up to the CPU because it's requesting the entire, you know, four bytes at a time for an integer. Cool. We're at five misses so far. Um, I hope you guys can see that when I go on and I need Y2, this now has a one right here. So it's going to have a tag of 0001. The eight is also going to be, it's the same number as this eight right there. So one, zero, zero, zero. It's going to be set one, the very first part of this. And I forgot to set that valid. So it's gonna go in this block. And then X3 is gonna go in this block and Y3 is gonna go in this block. And we're just gonna continuously replace everything. Keep clicking on the wrong screen. So that is confusing. I gotta remember to click the right screen. We'll have six, seven, and then eight misses when I get to Y3. Uh, so this is a, basically a 100% miss rate. Even though I'm using, I've got, you know, a really nice cache it's got two sets it's a direct mapped cache um, holds two bytes you would think that I should be able to do a little better than this because once I load the first thing I'm actually getting two two integers worth of data the other one it'd be great if it hung around and I could use it right away without having to go load it again so this where I'm continuously switching back and forth using the same set as a result of that um, conflict uh, missing um, is known as thrashing. Uh, there's a number of solutions that could make this work well. I'd really, I was using set zero for the first four numbers and then set one for the next four numbers. It'd be great if we could use them both. Um, there's a couple of pretty easy solutions to take advantage of that. The first one is just to declare an array for X with, uh, I think eight works. 
maybe it's six, I forget, uh, with extra space so that these addresses for y are not exactly lined up, 0, 4, 8, with the 1, 1, 1, 1, um, so that I'm getting the same set. I think it's a 6. Hold on. I think it's a 6. So basically, I reserve some extra memory and put some spacing between them, and then the y values are using set 1, while x is using set 0. When I get to x2 and x3, it switches that uses set 1, y uses set 0. All right, so that's one solution. Another solution is to use a better cache, and that's my next topic. I mean, I'm going to go ahead and restore this, so as you guys are going through the example, you can uh, make the changes yourself. So give me one second. All right, there we go. I've got this set back up. This is what it's now going to look like when you download the slides. Uh, so this is where you guys can like pull this up and start following along. Print this one out, take a pen, cross it out, uh, load it into PowerPoint, try it yourself. All right. Um, the next next thing I want to do is uh, let's see. Here we go. Talk about a different kind of cache. This is the set associative cache. So it's going to have more sets. The other one was direct. Every single piece of data only mapped to one place. Uh, so bytes one and two only mapped to set, or yeah, uh, x one and x two only mapped to set zero. Three and four only mapped to set one. Uh, y zero, y one only mapped to set zero. Uh, y two, y three only mapped to set one. They only had one place. It was a direct mapping, no choices. With the set associative cache, I don't know why I've got a blank slide there. Um, with the set fund, I've got more than one line and more than one set. So now I've gone and upgraded this, I've got two lines. If I take a look at this same example and kind of go through the same problem, so I hope this is useful and not super boring listening to me do the same thing over and over again. Now I've got the table uh, with the x0, x1. So here's the idea. I'm gonna go through my loop and look at each one of these x, and this still says plus. Man, I had a ton of mistakes here, guys. It's a good thing I'm doing this episode twice. All right, now when I look at x1, um, let me go grab my address box, put that in right there. Uh, X1 is stored at address 0. Perfect. Here is the set bit. So this is going to go in set 0 and my tag bit. Uh, 0, 0, 0, 0. So first, whoops, wrong screen. I love being able to edit on the fly. When I go grab this from data, it's going to put a 1 in the valid bit. Tag is going to be these four numbers right here. And then I'm going to do, I'm afraid I'm going to just make this a little simpler and go with, I'm storing a 1 and a 2. All right, so this is actually going to be four bytes worth of data and four bytes for the 2. Four bytes and four bytes. I think I like the vertical bar better. Yeah, I like that better. So please remember that this is just four bytes on each side for me. All right, um, yeah, so this will be a mess when I do that. So, but I grab the x0, and then uh, I'm gonna need a y0 to multiply by. So I go to y0, let me grab the binary address for that one. So that's gonna be, let's see, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, so also in set zero, but what I see is that I've got an open spot here, and I've got my choice. And we'll talk about replacement policies, but for now I'm just going to go with the best possible version and put it in the other one. So I'm going to make this valid. I'm going to put my tag value, 001, in here. And then I'm going to store, let's see, what's in this one? Number 4 and 3. Looks good. That was also a miss. I'm up to two misses. Well, X0 and Y0 missed. All right. Multiply those together, store them in sum. Next time through the loop, i is equal to 1, so I need x1. Let me grab the address for that real quick. We'll put it in my address box. This is going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0, 0. Yep, that's 4. Okay, so what I do is I go and I check and see I need set 0. Okay, set 0's got a bunch of lines in it. There's two of them. So I need to see if any of these lines match up with the tag. They do right here. Check that this top one matches the tag. Then I need to verify that it's valid. Perfect, it is. And then I'm going to go to byte offset 4. And remember, this one is actually 4 bytes. This 2 is 4 bytes. So it's going to grab the 2. 
it's in the cache. This is this might be the first time I've had something in the cache in like the last 45 minutes of me narrating. Our first hit. Okay, see, I told you this cache was better. All right, next thing, I need the Y1. Y1 is stored at memory address 14 over here. So in binary, that's this address. It's still going to be in set 0. So I'm going to jump up here to set 0 and check out all of the tags. I've got to look at all of them to see if any of these match. And it does right here, 0, 0, 0. Got the mouse on the wrong screen. Set 0, I've got to check out all the tags, find the match, 0, 0, 0, 1 is right here. I check it, it's valid. I've not written anything here to mess it up. So, and then I can go and get byte 4, and that's going to be the 3. Okay, it is. That's a second hit. Let me mark that. Celebration time. Okay, then the next uh, four things we're going to do, we're going to grab x2. So let me uh, grab the address for x2 there. See, that's going to be 0008. Missed. Still missed. Holy smokes, Mark. Okay, there we go. Almost 8. There we go. Uh, so 3 bits or zeros for the byte offset, 1 for the set. So now I'm looking at the other set. Uh, I'm going to check the tags and see if any of these tags are 0000. zero, zero, zero. They're not. So I'm going to go ahead and just go to memory, grab this tag, make it valid, and then store these numbers in the data. All right, so what have I got there? In byte 2, I've got a 3, and then a 4. All right, excellent. Now, uh, I'm going to do the same thing for the Y2. The only difference for Y is that it's got a 1 right there. So that's going to change. So, it, all right, once I look for this, I'm going to go up to set 1, because I've still got the set index of 1. Look and see if any of these are 0, 0, 0, 1. Uh, they're not. I've got some garbage tag that's not valid, and I've got four zeros. So that's going to take, and I'm just going to choose to put it right here in the second line. So tag will be one. We'll go ahead and we'll make it valid. And then for data, let's see, I've got the numbers two and one. So we'll stick in a two, a two, and a one. Excellent. So that was a miss for both the Hold on, hold on. Keep missing. I type on the wrong screen. This doesn't work. That's just going to take some practice. Two misses. One for X, two, one for Y, two. But then when I come back around and look for increment, I am looking for X3. X3 is going to be at memory address 0C. So that's going to be 0, 0, 0. All right. C is going to be um, 12. So that's going to be 8 plus 4. It's going to look like this. I'm going to be looking for set 1. So I'm checking out all of set 1 right here. Tag 0000, zero, zero, zero right here. Check it's valid. Things are looking good. And now I want to go to byte offset 4. So this first is 4 bytes. Byte offset 4 begins right here. This is number 4. Uh, it is in the cache. It's that one right there. Is there. So that'll be one more hit. All right, and then same thing for the very last one. The only difference here is that I've got a different tag. Um, this is going to be one. There'll be this second item right here. I'm looking for the fourth byte offset in set one with this tag. So <clears throat> that's also going to be a hit. So we can see by just switching to this different kind of cache. Now, granted, if I go back and look at this one, uh, this whoops, uh, thrashing, this one, it only had two sets with one line each. I've actually doubled the amount of data that I'm storing. I went from, let's see, that was 16 bytes to 32 bytes. There's 4, 8, 12, 16, yeah, 32. So I'm using a better cache. Um, but the idea here is that uh, because I've got these extra lines and I can store more than one thing with the same um, set index, I don't see that same style of thrashing problem. And my hit rate goes up dramatically. It went from like 0 to 50%. All right, so one more example, and that's going to be a fully associative cache. The idea here is that S is going to be equal to 1. We only have one set. So that means, okay, so a fully associative cache is going to be one that only has one set. It'll have lots of lines, and this is the 
uh, most versatile in terms of where I can store things. Uh, I've got four choices every time I, I go and grab a line. Um, and we're going to find that, wait, I'm going to leave this for you guys to go through on your own. Um, go ahead and just choose the best possible place to store each of these data. But make sure you can walk through this example. And again, oh, I copied and pasted that and never noticed. Um, all right, dot product, it's got a multiplier right there. Uh, but anyway, what you'll find is that each time the, you know, the cache is empty, as I use all four of these lines, I will get at least four misses while I load in and data initially. So there's going to be at least four misses. And what you'll find when you walk through this, I hope, is that you're able to grab all of these, uh, the second, fourth, sixth, and eighth piece of data will already be in the cache. So we'll get four hits from those. All right. Uh, so go ahead and uh, take a look at that one on your own. Uh, okay. There's just a couple of extra little details that are important when we come to writing. Uh, as in general, the memory access, uh, de determining whether something is in cache works exactly the same as reading. Um, but I've got some options here if I'm trying to write something depending on whether it's already in the cache or if it's not in the cache. So two options. My first, uh, if it's in the cache, I have two options. I can do something known as write through. And this is just going to say write it to cache and write it to the level below. And if we're talking about things where memory access is very quickly, this is a great policy for something like L1 to L2. So if I write to L1, just write it to L2 also at the same time. And then we'll look at L2 to L3. That's going to have a policy. It might say, go ahead, write through it, also write it to L3. And just cascade all the way down. And it's going to depend on that policy between each adjacent level. So there's a, a tra uh, write policy for each pair of things. The other version of that, if, if it's already in cache, is the write back version. Okay, and what this is going to do is write to level K, so just to L1, but then it's going to keep track of a special bit that says, okay, it's known as the dirty bit. I mean, it's like dirty data that's not stored on the hard drive yet. It's not stored in lower levels. It's only right here. And if you bring in new data and overwrite it, it will have lost that change. Okay, so it's going to take uh, one bit there and just mark it uh, so that whenever I come to the point where I need to evict this data and bring in a new um, block, it's going to know that it needs to write it at that point. And the idea here is that if I'm writing to one uh, memory location, I might be writing to a whole bunch of adjacent memory locations too. And if I've got you know 16 integers all in one line, if I'm writing to all of them, then I only need to do one write to a lower level. So we see this a lot where memory access is much, much slower, like main memory to the hard drive. So here it's going to just keep everything in main memory, mark that it needs to write it to the hard drive eventually, and wait until the last possible second so that I might make lots of changes to main memory. And then they'll just be written all at once to the hard drive. Okay. Now, in addition, I'm going to need policies for what's going on if the data that I want to write is not in cache at level K. So that means K doesn't have it, but K plus one might. Okay, so here's the idea. Uh, first choice is just go ahead and bring that data up to level K and then choose one of these right through or right back because it's now in level K. All right, that's one plan. Um, and we're going to see that this method frequently is uh, paired with the, um, oh man, which one is it? Uh, right allocate is frequently paired with the uh, right back version. Um, so here we might be moving something from the hard drive into into memory. We'll move it up, we'll make the change, and then we'll wait till the last possible second to write it back. That way it's uh, minimizing the expensive transfers. Okay? Um, and the other version is if it's not in cache at level K, don't bother to bring it up. Just directly skip down and write to level K. That way I don't have to evict anything from what I'm currently working with. So I could be writing to somewhere else in memory. I've got my working set of things that I'm using for math and I'm writing to, you know, I'm doing, going through an array, um, doing a dot product, coming up with a sum. And every time I write sum, I might just want to write it to a lower level. So that might be if I'm working with L1 cache for my X and Y vectors. If sum is in L2, I can just directly write it to there without having to replace something. So we'll frequently see this paired with the, uh, um, um, higher level, fast, faster versions of cache. All right, uh, next up, I'm almost finished here. 
uh, eviction policies. In fact, this might be the, the very last slide. We'll see in a second. I think it is. All right, so when I uh, have a fully associative set, like this one right here, as I start working with this, I've, if I've got a much bigger array, I'll bring in x1, I'll store it here. Uh, x1 will be also stored with x0. When I bring in x2, it'll be in the next line. x3 will be the second half. But eventually, I'm going to use up all four lines and need to evict something. So I've got several policies. Uh, first, I could just choose one of the lines at random and kick it out. Uh, that's a great policy. But um, I might be kicking out something that I you know, need again right away. Um, and I might have a much better you know, line that hasn't been used in a long time. That might be a better choice. Um, so another version is the least recently used model. This is actually the most commonly used model for eviction policies. Um, sometimes we'll see this random one uh, at the very highest level, the L1 cache, just because it's it's so small, there's so few blocks that um, by randomly removing one, I get the best performance. Um, anyway, the least recently used is going to be the, the least likely um, set of data that I need to access again. It likely means I'm done with it. Um, and so let me just go through an example of the least recently used pattern. I've got... Um, a cache here with three blocks, and I'm going to use this access pattern. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to need block zero. I'm just going to go ahead and stick it right here in this first block. Then I need uh, block one, so I'm going to go ahead and put it in this cache location. This cache, uh, this would be a line, a line of a fully associative cache. And then I'm going to need block two. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that right there. Uh, then when I need block one, it's already in cache right here. I'm set. Then let's see, there's zero, one, two, one, zero. Okay, now I need zero. That's right here already in cache. That's another hit. So I've got two hits so far. Then the next thing I need is a three. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go backwards and figure out that I've used zero, I've used one, and the least recently used one is two. So I'm gonna go ahead and replace my two with a three. Okay, so that was a miss. So far two hits, one miss. And well, the initial two, the cold misses. So uh, miss, 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 hit, hit, miss. And this will be a miss too because I don't have four in memory yet. So I'm going to go back and find the least recently used block. I've used three. It's not that one. I've used zero. It's not that one. It has to be this one. So I'm going to replace the one with the four. And then next thing I do, even though I need it next, I can't look ahead with this least, least recently used. I need a one now. So I'm going to go back and then say, okay, uh, I've used the four recently, can't be that one. I used the three recently, can't be that one. So it's going to replace the one with, uh, replace the zero with the one because that's what I need. Okay, so that's kind of the idea behind a least recently used uh, eviction policy. So I'm just going to look back over the last couple of accesses and keep track of which one was the most, you know, the one I used uh, least recently. Okay, um, another version of this is the least frequently used. Oh, I should probably talk a little bit about how this is actually implemented. How do they keep track of what's been used recently or not? This is all done in hardware. And I think the general idea is, um, right, uh, this least recently used pattern is frequently implemented in hardware with just a counter. So uh, like the program counter, for example, or an instruction counter. We can go ahead and say, okay, we've accessed something. Um, we've got the clock from the computer. We'll just uh, assign some of the bits from the clock to this. And then when I've accessed this one, um, I'll just grab whatever the clock says, the computer clock, uh, and store some of those bits right here. And then when it's time to replace something, I can just find the one with the smallest number, because that will have happened the longest time ago, and evict that one. So basically clock-based, um, storing some information about the time. Okay, um, next up, uh, let's talk about the least frequently used um, access pattern. So the idea here is that I'm going to go back and say if I'm using something a lot, I want to hang on to it. All right, so if I'm using it frequently, I need it. Um, so with this sort of pattern, i uh, got a little bit different example here. So I'm going to store 0 in my first block. I'm 0, 0, 0. Then I'm going to need a 1. Store that. Then we need a 2. And then I need a 1. So that's a hit there. So I've got miss, hit, hit, miss, miss, hit. All right, so three misses. And 
And let's see, one, two, three hits so far. Then when I get to this uh, first three right there, I need to replace something with the three. And I'm going to go back and see which of these three in the past, since it was brought in, is the least frequently used. So the zero has been used three times, the one has been used two times, and the two has only been used once. So that's the one I'm going to get rid of. Even though I just brought it in, I'm going to get rid of it immediately. Um, I don't know if this is a good plan. Uh, there's a lot of arguments for, you know, at pr pretty much for every policy you can find an example that's bad for it. But it seems to me like in this case, it's not, not a bad choice because I don't need the two again. In fact, I need a three, 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 like four times in a row. And then I need a four. So I'm going to look back and see that I have only used, uh, I've used the zero three times. I almost got a one in here. I've used that twice since it was brought in. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the one. Uh, three was used four times. So I'm going to stick the four right there. All right, when we implement something like a least frequently used access pattern, typically this is done with a counter. So every time I access one of these numbers, if it's already there, I increment a little counter. So each line is going to store some extra meta information for to count accesses. So every time I get a hit off it, I'm going to increment that counter. Now you think, um, well, the counters are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger um, until I run out of bits, because I don't use very many bits to store that. So one of the ways I can get around that, if I'm using three bits, as soon as I've accessed something eight times, I've just run out of bits to store something. What I'll do is I'll take all the counters, all three of these counters, and just shift everything to the to the right. So basically divide all of them by two. And then uh, just keep counting. Um, that, that way it'll give me an uh, opportunity to sort of clear out things that may have been used a lot a long time ago and uh, I no longer need, even if it was, you know, generate a huge number of counts in the very early life of the program. All right, guys, this is going to do it for this lecture. Um, I'm going to go look and see just how long it is and see if I want to break it into two pieces again. I feel like this was a lot smoother this time. I got a lot of the bugs worked out. Personally, I think this is a, a kind of a fun topic, but it turned out to be really hard to make slides for. So I hope you guys found this uh, usable, and I hope it makes reading the book easier. And I hope the exam goes really well for you. Um, pay particularly close attention when you're studying to these examples I walked through when I did all the individual steps to do this dot product. Uh, there's another really great example in the book. If you guys need a hint as to where to go study for something where we're doing a matrix transpose that runs into a lot of these very same issues um, with the thrashing, with the limited cache sizes, what happens with different types of caches. So I highly recommend you go check those out as well. Um, and if you have any questions, go ahead and post them on Piazza. Uh, the plan is my next project. It's already seven. It'll probably take me another 90 minutes to get this up and available on YouTube um, is to do the exam writing next and then go back and finish up the rest of those sort of bonus topics for the rest of the course. This is where the content that will actually be tested on the exam ends right here. I'm actually going to write the exam next and then come back with the uh, the bonus topics. And uh, anyway, have a great day.